Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AI seminar series of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Innovation. My name is Elio Huerta, and I am the director of this center. And today I am pleased to introduce Barbara McGillivray. She is the first in a series of Alan Turing researchers that will be talking about their research around AI and a broad number of topics ranging from linguistics uh, to climate change. Uh, Barbara research lies at the intersection between computational linguistics and historical linguistics, and more broadly, between data science and digital humanities. She has published three books on computational methods for historical languages. The first one is Methods in Latin Computational Linguistics. The second is Quantitative Historical Linguistics, a Corpus Framework. And the third one, Applying Language Technology in Humanities Research design, application, and the underlying logic. Her current research focuses on computational methods of meaning change in historical texts. And you can go and check her latest projects and publications in her page profile. And today she is going to be talking about computational models of meaning change. Barbara, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here, and I uh, wish I could have been there in person, but um, this way we get to reach a bigger audience, so I'm very excited to be sharing my research with you. I won't be able to see you, otherwise if we were in, a, in the same room I would ask you what's your background. Um, so we'll assume that yeah, there is an interdisciplinary uh, audience, which uh, suits me very well because I have a, a very interdisciplinary uh, background, as, as was just said. Um, and so um, uh, let's, let's start and then I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions at the end. I'm going to share my screen now and I hope you can see it. So um, the topic of my presentation is known as uh, semantic change in linguistics. If you're not a linguist, you may be wondering what this word uh, means. So I added a little um, coming strip to kind of lighten the, 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 th the tone. Um, but basically we're talking about um, the phenomenon at which words uh, change meaning. I actually um, have worked uh, for the Oxford Dictionaries and this was a, of course a very pressing topic for lexicographers and those uh, com compiling um, uh, dictionaries. Um, and um, um, I was very intrigued by the possibility of um, having computers help this process. Uh, so if you want to think about an example, uh, well, I'm old enough to remember when uh, surfing the web was a strange phrase and when surfing only meant, you know, going on, uh, on a, uh, a surfing board on, 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 on sea and web, web was the thing that was made by, um, um, uh, by spiders. Um, but of course, we all know that uh, the, both words have changed um, their meaning, have acquired new meanings in relation to the internet. Um, and possibly now um, the most common meanings of uh, surfing and web are um, the, the ones that uh, we're familiar with. Um, so we're talking about both new meanings appearing uh, and um, old meanings um, coming, um, kind of disappearing, uh, or existing meanings and changing their nature. So he, there had to be an example from dictionaries. So here it is. Uh, so as you uh, you will know, um, the meanings of words in dictionaries are recorded uh, with examples. And uh, as you can see, surf is um, of course had the original uh, physical meaning, and then a more um, a recent uh, meaning related to the internet. But this is a phenomenon that has happened in languages for centuries, actually for forever. Um, for example, uh, the, wo uh, the word bully uh, actually uh, used to be a term of endearment and, um, and then acquired a, a more negative connotation. So investigating how words change meaning uh, over time is actually of, of really, uh, a really big interest to historical linguistics, but not, uh, not only uh, historical linguists, also um, digital humanists, for example, historians, uh, particularly interested in uh, tracing the evolution of meaning of words as, um, as they express um, concepts. 
Um, so I'm interested in both aspects. On the historical side, um, English has this um, the, a very, very um, well-known um, resource, the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, which traces the meaning of, of, of words historically. So we'll uh, give you the, the original uh, first meaning with quotations, and then it will um, add, add uh, newer meanings. Um, so they, here you can see uh, a current dictionary, like the Oxford Dictionary of English, uh, lists just the, the, the current uh, meaning. So my presentation will uh, kind of jump between two ways of looking at this phenomenon. On the one hand, what happens when we look at contemporary um, data sets and, and texts, um, and look, we investigate semantic change on a short time scale. Uh, and on the other hand, what happens uh, when we look at a much longer time scale um, in a kind of historical perspective. So on the one hand, uh, contemporary um, corpora or uh, collections of texts um, are of particular relevance to applications of lang natural language processing. Uh, for example, um, if you are interested in certain um, areas like sentiment analysis, then uh, it's likely that you will want to know um, and detect the change in meaning of words as it happens, uh, so quite uh, fast because um, your tool uh, may be improved by knowing this information. So say that uh, you, um, you have a list of terms uh, coded as positive or negative. If a term changes its uh, polarity, uh, it becomes, for example, a negative term, positive then uh, your tool is gonna is gonna uh, be better if it's aware of this change and there was, of course a, a range of uh, research questions in computational social science related to um, identifying um, short-term uh, changes in meaning of words for example um, recently uh, took part in a project that traced, traced um, the semantic change of emojis and what and um, as a way into uh, looking at what this tells us about society today, um, I also will talk about some um, some research I've done on on Twitter and um, and web archives. Uh, on the other hand, a historical perspective on this topic um, is of relevance to fields like uh, lexicography and digital humanities and historical linguistics, as I mentioned before, and also. Uh, to cultural heritage. So um, when we um, we want to develop tools for uh, identifying um, the realization of concepts in historical texts, uh, we maybe want uh, maybe we may want to know um, what a word meant at a particular point in time because then our research um, our search can be more accurate. So for example, I may want to know the synonyms of the word happy. Um, over time and how those changed because I may be interested in analyzing um, the concept of happiness. In that case, I may want to know that, for example, gay at some point in, in the history of English meant happy and it stopped meaning happy uh, later on. So this is a very active area of research in natural language processing. Um, we have just shown four papers in this area, but there are um, dozens, uh, literally. Uh, it's of course still the niche, but um, in the past four years, it's grown really exponentially. And uh, they are uh, very good overviews of, of the state of the art. Um, I've uh, shown here uh, on the uh, bottom left corner, uh, one published in 2018. Uh, another one uh, around the same time um, at the top right corner. Um, and uh, here on the left, I, um, there's a screenshot of a paper that I'll be talking about at the end of my presentation because it, um, it presents the current state of the art. Uh, so what is interesting about this area of research is that it's so far stayed within the remit of natural language processing mainly, um, in spite of it having uh, really important um, applications and implications for other research areas. So one of the things I'd be suggesting is uh, uh, calling for more um, a st kind of a stronger uh, collaboration with, with other fields, for example, including digital humanities, um, to really um, improve uh, this research and, and, and um, take it to the next level. 
So I'll start uh, with historical texts. And this is a topic close to my heart. One of my um, uh, top uh, degrees was in classics. And, um, and that, uh, that interest has continued. And so I'll be reporting on a project uh, that applies invasion learning to ancient Greek. Just a little reminder, um, this was based on a um, paper, a very influential paper by Fairman and Lapata published in 2016. And they showed um, um, the power of um, uh, applying Bayesian learning uh, models, so uh, variations of, of topic models to um, a large historical uh, corpus of English. So what you can see here is um, a representation of the distribution of different meanings of the word power um, over time from 1700 to uh, 2000. So every bar uh, uh, represents a 20 year uh, time interval and the different colors correspond to the different um, uh, meanings or senses of the word power. And these senses are shown at the bottom, there, um, there's eight of them, and they are represented as a collection of, of words. So if you're familiar with topic models, um, this is basically a variation of a topic model where instead of, of um, representing topics, we're representing meanings of, of the same word. Um, and eight is chosen as a parameter of the model. So the model is, tries uh, very hard to cluster uh, the usages of, um, of this word in context into one of these eight uh, buckets. And um, what, what this visualization is, is an estimate of the probability distribution of each sense. So for example, um, you can see that the uh, violet um, sense in number six is very, um, you know, has very small probability early on. And then around the time of the industrial revolution, it uh, grows and it becomes uh, you know, quite, quite important in the, in the later periods. And that is the sense of power associated with um, energy, the meaning of energy. And this, the authors go further and um, I investigate um, the uh, profile of these different meanings. So zooming into uh, the uh, energy sense of power, they also are able to identify um, the nuances of meaning of this, uh, of this uh, uh, sense uh, over time. So in, in, within the energy sense of power, you see that earlier on it was associated to uh, words like water, um, and then steam uh, started coming in, and then uh, plant and, and, and nuclear. So um, we can see that even within the, state, the, the remit of the sense of energy for power, uh, we can witness the um, technological um, changes that happened you know, from water uh, to steam power to electric power and so on. Uh, so what we thought was, um, can we do something similar uh, in a very different context? And these, uh, these are three papers that came out of this uh, six months project, which actually continued um, beyond uh, stated uh, end date and was a very fruitful collaboration with um, the people listed here, um, a very interdisciplinary team with a classicist, a digital humanist, and then natural language processing researcher, a statistician, two statisticians, and a third one as well, who joined us. Um, and it, so uh, what we um, had to do first is um, collect a corpus. There wasn't an ancient Greek corpus that we could use uh, straight away. So we um, compiled one from um, freely available uh, text resources. And uh, we published a, a, a data paper describing it. Um, so it, it covers about 10 million tokens, so 10 million word occurrences. And uh, it spans uh, text from Homer, uh, so very early um, ancient Greek um, text to uh, the early um, fifth century after Christ. So it's pretty broad time frame, and uh, this is the profile of the corpus by genre. Uh, so we, um, you can see that uh, it's definitely not balanced uh, by genre. Certain genres are represented uh, more early on 
certain genres appear later and there definitely isn't um, an equal distribution. But this is the, the reality we, we have to deal with when working with historical texts. Um, yeah, spent, uh, as, as was said in the beginning, spent uh, two books is kind of investigating the challenges of dealing with uh, historical languages where we don't have the luxury to pick a corpus we we um, we use uh, just because we we need to maximize the amount of text that at our disposal we can't be can't afford to be uh, too selective um, about um, about the corpus and therefore we have to deal with uh, imbalanced um, data. Um, and uh, the insight we had was uh, we wanted to uh, adapt uh, Fre Fredman and Lapata's uh, model to the case of ancient Greek. And uh, the insight was that we, we wanted genre to play a, a, a role in this modeling um, because um, it is of course true that time is a factor in um, determining um, what meaning change but uh, genre is as important. Uh, so uh, certain genres may disregard um, a kind of diachronic or over time change of, of the meaning of words uh, because it may be that um, uh, in certain genres uh, the, 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 the meaning doesn't change. So uh, say, take an example, the word mus, which means, uh, which can mean uh, muscle um, as in the anatomical, um, part of the, of the body, but it can also mean uh, the animal, uh, mouse, the animal, or, or muscle, uh, um, the shellfish. And, and um, of course, if we're talking about um, a medical text, we're a lot more likely to, um, to find the uh, anatomical sense. So we wanted to combine these two um, factors, and more broadly, we wanted to um, propose a model that could uh, combine expert information, in this case represented by genre, with uh, time. And um, so what we, uh, we did was develop a model that could be uh, applied to genre, but in principle also to other factors, for example, geography or author. So this is the diagram uh, for the time, uh, for the topic model, the genre um, aware, um, a topic model that we developed. Um, it's not important to know the details, but what we uh, we did was de um, yeah, develop a model that could predict or uh, model the um, distribution of senses over time for every genre. And yeah, sense of a word is defined by um, a distribution of the words. Uh, so let's take an example to see uh, how this works in practice. Um, so the word paradisos um, is a very interesting one because it's a Persian loan word and its meaning um, expanded. So originally was, uh, it meant garden. And then uh, in the uh, Jewish tr Christian tradition, it acquired the meaning of, um, of paradise or garden of, of Eden. Uh, and, um, and so it is a, quite a subtle change because of course paradise is a type of garden but it's, it's a definite uh, change. And this example is actually, um, it also features in, in uh, the Economist uh, Christmas edition from 2020, where um, yeah, I was interviewed by uh, um, the Economist journalist who then wrote the article. And, and I, I actually talked about this project in quite some detail. Um, so if you can uh, read a popular version of, of this uh, in there. Um, so uh, this is what, what uh, our model um, pr produced as, as an output. Uh, so it's similar to the one you saw earlier about power. Uh, in this case, we have um, the word paradisos. Um, and so this is a kind of time, uh, time dependent but genre unaware version, uh, just to give you the baseline, uh, what is uh, possibly uh, more interesting is the genre version one. So um, just to, um, for those of you who know Greek, if you're interested, um, actually we had to uh, do quite a bit of a non-trivial analysis to identify these, um, um, these senses um, because um, often the words that came up to define the senses were not unique, you know, uh, uniquely associated to either garden or paradise. Uh, so for example, we had uh, the word um, fruit, 
here, which potentially could point to both, but because it occurs also with other words like uh, God and eat, uh, we can actually uh, pick up the reference to you know eating the the apple and and therefore the um, uh, it points to um, paradise. Um, other um, uh, the other senses uh, mentioned words water or place um, or a tree, uh, which um, yeah, related to the you know the original meaning. Um, so. Uh, doing this uh, manual labeling um, uh, allows us to then track uh, the emergence of the paradise or religious um, meaning over time. Um, so um, this is zooming in to the blue uh, bars, which are uh, the, uh, related to paradise. And as you can see, they uh, increase around the time uh, when the um, um, uh, Old Testament, uh, the Greek um, translations of the Old Testament uh, were produced and then it, it stays in the, in the later centuries. Uh, this is another visualization, different colors, same message, um, but you can see here the, the, the dis, um, distinction between the two macro genres. So as I mentioned before, we um, experimented with a genre aware version of our model and um, and it, here um, it produced um, two uh, plots: one for religious texts on the right, and one for non-religious texts on the on the left. Um, and again, yeah, different colors, but basically the first two colors, so the purple and blue ones, refer to the paradise sense. So the the, the more recent um, uh, kind of religious uh, meaning, and the 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 bottom two, the green and the yellow one. Uh, refer to the original meaning. And as you can see here, um, in the religious texts, uh, the, uh, the, the blue and uh, um, purple um, really uh, take over in the more in, in second half of the, of the time period and the investigation, which uh, corresponds to uh, the, um, the knowledge that yeah, um, you know, the paradise where of course it was, a, was start, it started being used as from the Old Testament and, 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 and later. Uh, in the non-religious text, it's, the, the, the picture is a bit more nuanced, uh, but we can see again uh, the uh, religious meaning, but with some exception due to uh, little data, uh, but in, in generally we see it coming uh, again from the third century um, for Christ. And we also see this as a feature of our corpus because it's not, be, it not being balanced. Uh, means that, in fact, um, a lot of the um, non-religious texts actually contain the religious meaning. So um, this, um, these are, this, is, this project taught us a lot about um, how to make these models work in a um, historical context where the emphasis is more on scaling up analysis that um, philologists and, and linguists would do uh, by hand and, and getting new insights into the language. So the emphasis really is on, on um, learning about the language and also being able to quantify trends at a scale that would not be possible uh, with manual analysis. And we deal with limited and idiosyncratic uh, corpora so what we dis, um, we adopted as a strategy for dealing with this uh, in these challenges is um, a, a knowledge-rich modeling. In my particular case, was using genre as um, an additional element uh, to inform our modeling, but this can be applied to other uh, dimensions. Uh, what I'll look at now is a very different um, set of projects to deal with semantic change in contemporary texts. Um, and they will not uh, use Bayesian modeling, but uh, word vectors and word embeddings. And I'll explain what uh, this means for those who are not familiar with the term. Um, so um, representing words as um, directions in geometrical spaces or, or vectors and has been uh, kind of as has been done for, for quite some time. And it relies on the so-called distribution of hypothesis where um, uh, the idea is that you can infer elements of the meaning of a word by looking at its context. And words that share element, the same context tend to have a similar meaning. And so we can apply this um, 
also over time, and this is the, ba the basic um, uh, strategy um, that is adopted uh, for, um, for applying these models on and to um, semantic change detection. So for example, here you can see man and woman uh, being uh, close together in the space because they tend to appear in similar contexts. Uh, and on the, on the other hand, you see words are related to uh, na names of fruit. So the intuition of applying this in a time um, to kind of time study is that we can um, uh, divide our uh, corpus of text into our time buckets, for example, uh, every 10 years. And then we can analyze uh, the similarity between words and how that changes over time. So a word like tweet, uh, which uh, before the launch of Twitter actually only referred to the sound made up made by birds was obviously quite different from the word message in the 1990. Uh, but then over time, um, because of the change in the semantics or the meaning of tweet uh, and the launch of Twitter, and, um, the two words would, would get closer together uh, because their uh, meaning uh, meanings were, became more and more similar. So this is the intuition that was adopted by another very influential paper uh, by Hamilton and I told to publish in 2016, where they were able to, um, to use this intuition to, to identify uh, changes in meanings of words, uh, for example, gay, um, which went from being synonym of uh, cheerful and, and pleasant to a uh, synonym of homosexual. Um, and other terms that may be less known also identified uh, in, this, in their evolution. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of projects now. One, um, the first one um, deals with uh, finding semantic change in web archives. Um, and uh, we've published a couple of papers on this, one with Pierpaolo uh, Basile, one uh, with um, um, an, a, a, another interdisciplinary team um, at the Alan Turing Institute with uh, mathematicians and natural language processing researchers. So you can find more info here in these papers. Um, so we dealt with a very different corpus compared to the ancient Greek one. In this case, uh, it's a UK web archive, uh, which contains um, all web pages in the, um, hosted on domains ending uh, in .uk between 1996 and 2013. So it's, it's a much smaller time frame than uh, the previous one, uh, but it's a much larger corpus. We're actually talking about 60 terabyte of, of files, uh, raw files, which were then reduced to three terabyte of uh, tokens of text, of here, raw text. Um, so we did a bit of pre-processing to get to this point and three terabytes is still quite, quite, quite big. Uh, so we extracted um, what we called uh, word context matrices. So the context of occurrence of every, uh, every word up over um, a certain uh, minimum frequency threshold. So here, for example, we see Linux being you know, the target word and all of these being its context words were followed by um, their frequency. So swapping occurs four times with Linux, for example. And this was a starting point for generating word vectors. Um, so of a similar type to what I showed you earlier with man, woman, and uh, the names of fruit, uh, we actually um, built random indexing vectors. If you haven't heard the term, it's um, it's type of vector that is actually really good, um, really good with uh, large um, large scale corpora. So the idea is that you um, take a, a target word like fox in this example, you choose a context window, say two words to the left, two words to the right. And then uh, you generate uh, vectors for all words. And you do that by assigning a random vector to each term in your vocabulary. Um, and then this, the word, um, the semantic vector for a term is a sum of all the context vectors. Um, so uh, a random vector is um, a sequence of minus one, zero, and one uh, values. Uh, so it tends to be very sparse, uh, very long. Um, and the idea is that by adding up 
all the vectors for the context words of a, of a word, you get uh, a good representation for that word. So for example, here for fox, we would collect all the random vectors for all the words occurring with fox. In this case, it would be actually the whole sentence if we decide um, the context to be uh, this uh, large. And then we add up, uh, yeah, okay. For, for context word two, sorry, um, we only constrict interested in quick brown and jumps over and we add them all up and we get a vector for fox. If we do that for all the words, we can then uh, start calculating um, similarities between words. And uh, because we're interested in change over time, we use the temporal version of this random indexing algorithm where we split our corpus into yearly buckets and then we generate these vectors for every yearly bucket. Uh, and what we can do then is compare the vector for the word in at a certain point in time and the vector for the same word at a different point in time. So say we're interested in surf, we have the vector for surf in 1996 and vector for surf in 2001. We look, can look at how different they are because uh, we're talking about uh, temporal random indexing vectors. If you're familiar with um, word embeddings, they're different because they, they actually um, they don't require any uh, kind of uh, additional computational uh, power to, to to be calculated, and so and also the the word spaces are directly comparable over time. So we can. Uh, simply calculate um, what is called known as the cosine similarity between uh, the two vectors to find out how how different they are. Um, and we can do that over time for every year and it can generate a time series of these um, similarity measures. Uh, we do it in three different flavors. I won't go into the details because of lack of time, but I can um, answer the uh, question if you're interested. But basically, once we have a vector for, say, the word tweet in every year, we can trace um, the, the similarity between tweet in one year and the tweet in the next year, and so on, and then pick up any significant change in this time series. Uh, again, I won't go into the details of how we do that, but basically it's looking at where there is a, a significant dip or um, in, in the time uh, series. And that is taken as an indication that the word has changed its meaning. So uh, for example, here we have <coughs> the similarity between bird and tweet, which used to be high and kind of went down because tweet acquired a new meaning in addition to the bird related one. And it has to do with messaging and posting. So similarity between tweet and message and post uh, goes up uh, in, in conjunction to this change. So by looking at these time series, we can actually um, see um, indications of, of change. Um, and we um, evaluated this method against uh, the Oxford English Dictionary as a gold standard. Uh, so it tells us when the word changes its meaning. So we were able to measure the quality of our, of our different uh, models we found out the precision was very low because the number of words that, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, changed was very small. So we were finding a, a lot more words, and we um, we need to look into the details of this. But we argue that uh, we maybe have we have may have found uh, genuine uh, changes that were just not recorded in the dictionary. But what's interesting is that our recall is quite high, about over 80%, meaning that of the words that we did uh, find as having changed, a lot of them were in the dictionary. And we developed this methodology further uh, in, an, in our second paper uh, by adopting the um, intuition that uh, we can, um, not all words are the same, some words change and others for sure never change. So we call these anchor words. And what we did was um, applying a different, uh, a variation of the method by Hamilton et al, which is this, this time based on word embeddings. Um, so not word vector, random indexing vectors, but actual um, and, uh, negative sampling uh, word embeddings, type of word to vec type of embeddings. 
Um, but so they, if you're not familiar with the term, these are, again, um, rep representations of, uh, of, of a word as a sequence of numbers, but in this case, they tend to be quite dense and they are a result of a neural model. So what we did was we, um, uh, we used a set of anchor words, words that we knew never changed, like the, or at, or of. And then we, um, we aligned the spaces over time, um, uh, basically using these anchor words. And then we looked at how much a, no a non-anchor word had changed over time. And we found interesting cases, for example, tweet, as I commented earlier, or cloud, or blackberry, uh, which all actually changed um, due to uh, some technolo technological advances. This is another other examples of, of uh, how the neighborhood of these words, also the words related, uh, kind of similar to them change. So blackberry on the top left uh, corner uh, went from being similar to other words for berries or herbs to being similar to words that have to do with smartphones. Uh, so it's nice uh, confirmation of the type of changes we, we found. Uh, a final example of, a, of our uh, project dealing with semantic change in an even smaller time frame. It's this paper um, that I co-authored um, people um, from, uh, from the, Turing, the Alan Turing Institute. Um, in this case, we were looking at a time frame between 2012 and 2017, like have 1.6 billion tweets, um, 20 billion tokens, and we experimented with, with word embeddings at the monthly uh, level because we had so much data and, and so little, we got a such short time frame. And so we experimented with different variations of uh, training and uh, tracing word embeddings over time. Um, so I'll, for reasons of time, I'll also skip through the details of this. So I should show you some of the findings. Um, so these are words that, uh, depending on the different parameters of our model, um, uh, turned out to have, have changed um, in the period uh, in consideration. So you can see they are not necessarily words that would come, come to mind when uh, thinking about semantic change. But these are words that uh, have changed due to uh, typically Twitter related changes. So for example, Vine um, obviously has the com common uh, English uh, meaning, you know, Engl meaning in English of you know, related to grapes. But in, in uh, January 2013, uh, there was a video hosting platform called Vine, which was launched. And so our system was able to detect this change. Oh, clearly it's not, the type of change that maybe the lexicographers or dictionary makers would be interested in, but it's nevertheless an uh, interesting uh, change which tells us about uh, the type of entities being talked about uh, on social media. Other examples are about uh, rap songs uh, and uh, video. Uh, so um, I will finish off by uh, giving a bit of an overview of where we are at in this very exciting research area. This is again a paper that came out uh, at the end of last year um, and it was in conjunction with uh, a shared task that we organized as part of the Semival 2020 uh, competition. So we uh, proposed a task that dealt with semantic change detection as you can imagine uh, for four languages, Latin, ancient, uh, sorry, Latin, English, Swedish, and German, we divided the task into two subtasks. One was a binary task, given us a list of words, which ones changed and which ones didn't, and between uh, two time periods that we set. And another was a, a great graded task, so uh, given a set of words, can you rank them according to how much they changed? And it was actually a very successful task, uh, 33 teams, submitted 186 systems. So we were able to get a very good picture of where uh, the state of the art is. So these are the two subtasks that I mentioned earlier. So we were interested in a specific type of semantic change it's when, um, when a new sense or, uh, is, is gained or, or a, a sense is lost between two uh, discrete time periods. 
so for example the word cell um, in English having changed from you know, the biology sense to the phone related sense. Uh, so these are the details of our copra uh, span over uh, more or less the uh, 19th 20th century for all the modern languages and uh, the, basically several centuries uh, for Latin. Um, and this is a mini summary of what we found. So lots of systems were based on type embedding. So uh, basically they relied on the type of method that I showed you earlier about where uh, the web archive and the Twitter projects. So every word is, is um, associated to a vector, a, a word type vector embedding. And um, these actually turned out to, to perform the best in most cases. Um, token embeddings, on the other hand, are very fashionable at the moment. If you heard of BERT or ELMO embeddings, and they rely on basically uh, defining an embedding for every token of a word. Token of a word is an instance of a word in context. So instead of saying creating an embedding for the word cell, you'd create a single embedding for every time cell is found in our corp on your corpora. And in spite of the expectations, these models did a little worse than the other ones. And then the uh, other types uh, and some of mod models as well did, did well. Um, so where are we next? Where are we going next? Well, this, as I said, is, is a very fast moving um, research area with lots of applications. What I could say from my experience, having worked uh, with this phenomenon of, you know, on a range of different uh, corpora and uh, languages is that uh, we have two different approaches depending on the type of time frame and languages you're dealing with. Um, so is that, um, as I said earlier, the historical texts lend themselves more to re research questions that have to do with you know, how can we uh, learn new things about language, whereas uh, contemporary data sets and methods are more focused on you know, beating a state of the art, uh, for the applications in the real world. Uh, we tend to have much larger, but also standardized corpora, so easier to deal with in one sense. And typically uh, word embeddings that not necessarily knowledge rich methods tend to work quite well. So what I find interesting and exciting um, thinking ahead is how can we combine uh, the pros of, of both uh, ways of, of, of doing this research and how can we incorporate uh, knowledge information into uh, what are still quite shallow methods used in contemporary data sets to perform even better. And how more broadly do we get communities to talk together and work together to, uh, to um, further um, this area. So I'll stop here. Uh, these are my email addresses and I'm very happy to be answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. This was a very exciting presentation. It's amazing how language changed so much and uh, sometimes we are not aware of that. So it, it is really exciting to, to hear this work at the interface of linguistics and computer science. Very nice. Thank you. So if you have questions, uh, we have two options. You can send the questions directly to Barbara via chat um, if you have any or you can raise your hand if you want and if you uh the hosts uh it experts if you are able to open the camera to see the person and avoid any disruption that is also a possibility so raise your hands if you have a question i i did get one man one question here okay. but uh yeah it's a uh, uh yeah so i can start with that one um Question, but uh, sorry about the background. Uh, where can one find a conceptual thesaurus? I second is not a synonym for time, but it is conceptually related. Oh, that's that's yeah, that touches on a very uh, hot topic um, because um, there are of course a lot of resources that linguists and computational linguists use. Uh, to um, incorporate the knowledge about how words are related. So um, thesauri, thesauri tend to organize words in synonym sets, but then you have resources like WordNet, um, which are um, which organize um, words in synonym sets, but also 
uh, or in a kind of increasing level of uh, general. So you have, say, very uh, granular uh, details about uh, types of animals, and then you go up to uh, beings and up to entities, et cetera, et cetera. So you have hyponym and hyponym relations. And uh, as far as I know, um, there hasn't been anyone who's used these resources explicitly to uh, and apply them to this uh, question on semantic change. So how do we uh, use these resources to have identify semantic change? But it is an area I'm, uh, I'm experimenting with. Um, I just submitted a paper uh, a few months, a few weeks ago uh, to, to, to ACL. So we'll hopefully get a positive outcome. Uh, so more on this uh, to come, so watch this space. Do you have another question queued up? Otherwise, I can ask you one. Yeah, I don't have any here. So. OK, so I, I had a colleague uh, back in Cambridge who was studying the evolution of language in terms of um, topography as well. Um, so maybe in the past, there was a rapid evolution of languages at the border of countries that spoke different languages. Now, uh, maybe it makes sense in this day and age to look at how Twitter is transforming language. So maybe you're not looking at the border of countries, but uh, where people are tweeting the most and how they are influencing the, the way people speak. So how could you do something of that nature these days? Ah, that's really exciting. So the, uh, the name that comes to mind is Jack Green from Birmingham. He's done uh, quite a lot of research on um, enthusiasm in the back there, uh, on um, dialectal uh, analysis using social media data. Um, and uh, when I talked about knowledge rich methods, actually that uh, geography was a use case I had in mind um, because um, what we could do is uh, not just uh, uh, divide our data by time, but also look at uh, geography, location um, of the tweets, for example, and then um, and use spatial uh, modeling combined with time modeling uh, to uh, to really model the diffusion of, of language. It's something I'm particularly interested in. I'm actually involved in a project that is looking at not geographical spread, but social spread using Reddit communities. So um, yeah, um, that's one of the directions that I think uh, we should be taking to really um, make an impact in this uh, direction. So thank you. There is also another question I have here. Um, I wonder if you will look into the motivations of semantic change such as societal changes and human cognition. Also, can the data detect the association between the semantic change and a specific person? For example, Shakespeare is credited with the invention of many new usages in English. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, really interesting. So two questions in one. Uh, one is about the motivations as societal changes and human cognition. And uh, that's actually something I've started looking at uh, with a, a thesis that I'm supervising at the moment. And we are trying to uh, disentangle um, ex external factors like technological change and, and societal change could be also an example with language internal factors. Uh, so again, watch this space. We'll probably try and publish this research as well. Um, but um, there's definitely been research in doing this qualitatively, but as far as I know, no one has done um, large scale quantitative analysis. So um, yeah, definitely. And then associating change to a specific person, it, I kind of think it's probably similar in a way to what uh, was uh, said earlier, um, because we could be um, analyzing not the effect of a societal change, but the effect of person or an uh, event. Um, I did publish a paper last year with Stephen Wilson and uh, Valid Magdi and um, Gareth Tewson on, um, uh, sorry, Gar Gareth, yes, on uh, Tyson, on um, uh, linking um, Urban Dictionary and Twitter and looking at 
how, um, how to what extent Urban Dictionary, which is uh, supposed to track uh, very innovative usages of language, precedes or follows uh, usages in Twitter. Uh, and so we, um, we could be doing that historically by looking at Shakespeare versus his contemporaries. Um, so yeah, lots of food for thought. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, really interesting questions for sparkling discussion. I have another one. This uh -huh. is um, related to uh, the section where you were talking about the origins and evolution of the word paradise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I have two questions. The first is, why don't you go back all the way to Hebrew uh, to actually see the first instance of that word? And the second one is, um, I think this has become quite spread um, in the literature and paintings, etc. But when was the first um, time that people referred to, to this forbidden fruit as an apple? because I don't see that information in the original manuscripts, right? So who, who had this idea of associating that forbidden fruit with an apple? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, I, it's a good question. I, I can't answer because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but I think it would be worth looking into, um, into the details of this. Uh, yeah, it'd be interesting because actually these methods allow us um, more quickly to, to test assumptions that, that we all have about language. So having access to the historical texts and having the tools to analyze them in this way could you know, really help us answer these questions. Um, what, uh, then going back to Hebrew, definitely um, multilingual semantic change has yet not been done. Uh, but it would be absolutely uh, critical. Uh, I'm actually thinking about also looking at ancient Greek and Latin because uh, uh, the, the languages I happen to have studied, but um, definitely um, anything uh, that investigates large scale, um, long or long, long uh, span uh, semantic change should be looking at um, at different languages. It obviously adds an element of complexity, uh, but I think it will come uh, in, the, in the next uh, research, uh, over the next yeah, year, I would say. Um, I know there is, a, there, there is a multilingual word net, for example, so that allows us to link um, concepts, so you call them concepts, or the sets of synonyms at least uh, across different languages so we could use that as a starting point so um, do you have another question here um, which AI um, ML methods do you think will be most appropriate as NLP evolves to comprehend the semantic issues you've highlighted in the talk um, so I uh, I think that, uh, as kind of hinted at, knowledge-rich um, methods are the way to go. So, so far, uh, th there have been a very shallow uh, type of models that basically just look at um, word embeddings or, or um, token embeddings. Um, I think we what we'll see going forward is a bit more sophisticated approach where we can, for example, embed world knowledge, uh, world knowledge basis, or at least linguistic knowledge basis, like this is already we talked about earlier, to really make the systems more intelligent. So, for example, we talked about societal changes. Can we make the uh, algorithm um, aware of uh, of this of these changes? Uh, so can we incorporate word knowledge about say uh, events or you know um, big phenomena like industrial revolution or authors like Shakespeare um, in a way that suggests uh, kind of pushes you know the phenomenon of semantic change uh, makes it more likely under certain conditions uh, so that's something I'm very uh, interested in I know there's been research in this area it's called knowledge in injection it's been applied to um, tools like uh, question answering, where you are required to 
access word knowledge to answer a question formulated in natural language. Um, but uh, no one has so far applied it in a historical or time sensitive perspective. Um, but you know, we do have access to resources like uh, Wikipedia and Wikidata, for example. Uh, so I think that's going to be um, the where where we, we're going in terms of um, machine learning methods. Thank you for the questions. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this quite enlightening uh, discussion. Um, language is definitely something that is continuously evolving, um, and we no longer have barriers, right? Um, it, it is amazing how. Uh, at least here in the US, you see the impact of different languages, um, how they adopt and then change lang uh, English. And in Europe, this is obviously even more pronounced. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your, uh, your insights and your expertise on this topic. Um, I do hope that experts that attended the, the meeting today reach out to you. Yeah. And, uh, the plan is in place to create better collaborations with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me for this opportunity. And yes, I uh, encourage everyone to contact me. Uh, my email address is you can Google me and you'll probably find um, my Turing profile on, on the top, top results. Um, that's my most up to date uh, page. And you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, and I'm also editor in, G in chief of the Journal of Open Humanities Data. So if you happen to have a data set um, for humanities research, uh, you can check out the Journal of Open Humanities Data and uh, uh, get in touch uh, through there. So yeah, thanks again. And I hope you have a nice rest of your day or evening, depending where you are in the world. Okay, thank you. And yeah. um, this concludes our presentation. Thank you all for attending.